Hi everyone, welcome to the story. We are on chapter 22 on page 309 in the hardcover book. Um, if you have a different edition, you're gonna have to do a little bit of digging yourself to find chapter 22. Um, but we have crossed over into the New Testament account and this specifically is titled The Birth of the King. And so we are digging into the birth of Jesus, which is pretty exciting stuff. Um, for some of you who are not familiar with it, the beginning of this chapter might seem a little bit strange as it starts with, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Doesn't sound like a Christmas story, does it? And yet that is how the gospel of John begins. Um, I have always been taught, and this is something that my husband and I will both tell people. If you are new to reading scripture, the gospel of John is a beautiful place to start. Now, it's not going to be strictly narrative in the sense of how us going through the story has functioned with um, starting at the beginning chronologically and going to the end. It is still in chronological order, but John's gospel is poetic prose. It's really, really beautiful, and it's a great discourse on faith and on Jesus and getting to know his character and who he is. Um, so I highly commend that book to you. In fact, um, a number of years ago, back in 2014, uh, my, well, I actually lost both of my grandmothers in the span of a few months, but my mom's mother passed away in September. Um, and I was having a really hard time with some other things personally going on then and it was just the final thing for me to deal with and it just tipped me over the edge emotionally I was so vulnerable and so my dad and I were driving up to Nebraska to be there with family for the funeral my mom was already there was able to be there at the end of her mother's life which was such a blessing um, but on the way up, I pulled up a Bible app on my phone and listened to the entire Gospel of John. I don't know if you know this, but a lot of the Bible apps actually have the ability to listen to Scripture. And so if that's helpful for you, if you get distracted trying to read with your eyes and you find audiobooks more helpful, um, definitely look into that. The Scripture apps are free, most of them. Um, they may have some paid features, they may have some other things, but this is an inexpensive way to be able to listen to scripture and spend time in God's word. So I commend that to you. Um, it was really helpful for me at a time when I was particularly low to spend time in the entirety of John's gospel. So if that's something you have an opportunity to do, I, I highly recommend it. So here we are beginning in the new Testament. We're digging into this story that well, once we get past the portions that are from the Gospel of John, if you're not familiar with that, they should sound extraordinarily familiar to you because every church Christmas program throughout time has used these passages um, from both Matthew and Luke. Um, the, the Gospel of Mark doesn't have any sort of account of the beginning of Jesus' life. It jumps right into the beginning of his ministry. But the other three Gospels start... With the beginning of the time that Jesus walked on this earth in various ways. John with his more poetic setting of the word being there in the beginning. Um, but Matthew and Luke actually deal with um, Jesus's earthly parents, Mary and Joseph, um, the angels coming to them and telling them what to expect about this child, all of the things of his miraculous conception and his birth and what um, what it will be like for them. Um, and so this chapter takes us from that point all the way through the account we have of Jesus at the age of 12. Um, so join me the, uh, during this video and we're gonna dig into our bookmark questions and I pray that this will be beneficial to you. So if you didn't catch it from the very first part where we deal with the Gospel of John, Jesus was there in the very beginning. He is the Word made flesh. We have a living Word of God, and it is Jesus. And I can't explain it any better than that. Um, I just 
trust and believe it. But Jesus was there in the beginning when God said, let there be light. God speaking those words, that was Jesus present at the beginning of all creation. So this is not some odd thing coming out of the blue. We've been tracing this through the whole of this story. Um, As we've been reading, we've been looking for the glimpses of Jesus. And here he is in the flesh, God incarnate. So it's just really exciting to me that we've gotten to this place. I love how even as we dig into the life of Jesus himself, we see these pieces of God's protection and calling his people out from places where they have been. Um, Here, Joseph is instructed to take his family to Egypt to hide from the rulers who want to kill Jesus, to hide from Herod who is so jealous that he cannot even abide an infant who has been promised by the stars, by prophecy, to be the king. And so he slaughters hundreds if not thousands of children under the age of two. It's heartbreaking to think about. When I read the verse, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more, I know what that pain feels like. I've been there. And to have that happen at the hands of a ruler is just unfathomable. And yet, after Herod dies, Joseph is told by an angel to bring his family back to Israel so that Jesus can be raised there. That's where he is from. These are his people. This is the place where he is to grow up to become the Messiah. So this is something that I've been pondering for a really long time now. Um, So just um, bear with me for a second. But one of the things that I find so interesting about our visual depictions of the Christmas account, think about your favorite nativity scene. Maybe it's one you've seen in public. Maybe it's one you have in your home or you put in your front yard, whatever that might look like. Um, And think of the one that has the most characters in it. So you have Mary and Joseph, baby Jesus, a couple shepherds, you know, if it's a really elaborate one, maybe several shepherds, sheep, other kinds of animals, um, perhaps the wise men will be a part of that, and camels. You you might notice from reading through this um, that, uh, and I'm really thankful that the story here makes this clear, that the time period of the wise men and the shepherds is totally different, but it's real easy for us to combine them all into one fun story and it gives us enough characters for all the kids. But Mary and Joseph are the only people from their immediate family that are present in our nativity scenes because that is all we are given a glimpse of in scripture. So we see in this, these familiar verses Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. Most of our storytelling of the birth of Jesus, we have this image of Mary and Joseph traveling alone, coming to Bethlehem just in time for the birth of Jesus and being completely and utterly isolated in a stable. But nowhere in here does it say that is actually true. It says that Joseph and Mary went together to be registered because she was expecting a child. And then it says, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. We don't know how long they were there. It could have been a few hours, a few days, weeks, maybe even months. We don't know. Um, But the other thing that's interesting is it says, Joseph went to the town, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. Joseph was not the only member of his family 
he would have had other family in that house and line of David, perhaps living near them in Nazareth, perhaps living in Bethlehem, family members. And so the last few years, I've been actually pondering this and thinking to myself, you know, historically speaking, um, it's only been very, very recent years that men have been present at the birth of children. Um, I mean, aside from doctors for the past couple hundred years or so, but it was always women who walked each other through this. So I'd like you to take a moment and just picture it for a second that Joseph may have been outside pacing. Maybe he was one of the first ones to greet the shepherds when they showed up, um, surrounded by other men from his family. And inside was Mary surrounded by every woman from Joseph's family, maybe his sisters or his cousins or his aunts guiding her through that process because they were part of a greater family group. And the reason that I know that is because you look to the end of the chapter where it talks about Jesus and his parents going to Jerusalem for the festival of Passover. It says after the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. You see, when they would go to Jerusalem for the feast every single year, they would travel in a caravan of many people, family and friends. It's pretty typical of that time period that people would travel in groups. It was safer. So the likelihood of Mary and Joseph by themselves traveling in the dark. I mean, think about your image of the nativity story, them traveling by themselves in the dark alone. It's not very likely that that's actually the case. And nowhere in scripture does it say that that's what they were doing. Instead, I'd like you to shift that mental image to an entire caravan of Joseph's family traveling together, protecting Mary, keeping them both safe, and then walking them through this process of the birth of the Savior. When the shepherds showed up, the room was probably pretty full, that stable that they were in. Maybe that's why they had to stay in a stable, because it wasn't just two people needing a room at the inn. It was a whole caravan full. Just think about that. Jesus was there at the beginning of all creation. And here, we see the beginning of his life on earth. His human parents, Mary and Joseph, are told by angels what to expect. And we see the angels once again singing praise over the infant Jesus when he is born. There's a whole lot more to this chapter but really, I just love the fact that we see angels all along the way from the beginning telling Mary and Joseph, it's going to be okay. You're going to have a child. He's going to save the world. All the way until his birth when the angels announce this great and glorious event to shepherds, probably the lowest of low people. It would have been smelly and dirty, living out in the fields with sheep who, if you've ever been around sheep, they don't smell very good. More than likely illiterate. Might not have been the brightest. And yet, they were the ones sent to proclaim the birth. It's pretty exciting stuff. So the question about pointing to Jesus, it's kind of funny because it's just all Jesus. And I think the next few chapters are really going to be that way, pointing us to him. But that's the point of scripture, isn't it? We see in the Old Testament, everything pointing forward and saying, look ahead, he's coming. 
And in this chapter, we can finally say, he's here. What's beautiful is throughout all of scripture that look ahead, he's coming. That's still true for you and for me because Jesus will come again to take us home, to be with him in heaven. More than likely, there wasn't a lot of new in this chapter for you. Um, definitely wasn't for me. I've spent a lot of time in these sections. Um, I may not always get through reading all of the Gospels if I sit down to do it, but I definitely get through the beginnings of them. And so all of this I've read again and again, but there's always something new every time. I love how we see the prophecy that God will call out of Egypt, I will call my son. Up until this point, that reference would have made people think back to the people of Israel being in slavery in Egypt. And isn't it kind of amazing that Egypt is a place where Joseph and Mary can find refuge and safety when for God's people, hundreds of years before, Egypt was not safe at all. And yet before that, for another Joseph, Egypt was a place of refuge. I find it very interesting that the two most famous Josephs in scripture both found safety in Egypt, in a place that still exists to this day. So many borders and countries and names of countries have changed throughout the centuries. And yet, here is this place that's still there where Jesus once walked. And I could argue the same thing for Israel, though that has changed hands so many times through the years that it's difficult to keep up with. But to know that both Josephs found safety and refuge in Egypt and were eventually brought back to the promised land. The first Joseph, it was his bones that were returned with the children of Israel after they left slavery so that he could be buried there. And the second returned with his wife and his son. Thank you so much for joining me. The Lord's blessings on the rest of your week. Um, let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, gracious Lord, thank you for your son, our Savior, Jesus. We thank you for your servants, Mary and Joseph, who said yes when they were called by you to be the earthly parents of our Savior. We ask you to bless us now as we continue in our journey with Jesus during this Lenten season, as we look forward to the cross and eventually the empty tomb. Be with us now as we begin our week and continue to walk by our sides every day as you have. Pray all of this in the precious name of your Son, our Savior. Amen. Thanks again for joining me. The Lord's blessings on your week. Um, please let us know if you we need anything from us at all. We are here to help. Um, drop a comment and just let me know where you're watching this from. I really would like to know. That's really exciting for me to see those things. Anyway, have a great week. We'll have devotions back at 5 o'clock tomorrow night. Bye.